Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's edition of Black Health Trust. We're so happy that you chose to spend some time with us today. And we are going to have a very interesting conversation today about where we are with COVID and what where we're going. And without further ado, I will turn it over to our founder, Dr. Randall Maxey. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to my co-moderators and to our other guests and to our advisory members as well. Uh, last week, we were treated to what I think is one of our signal uh, and significant talks by uh, Dr. Hildreth, who is the 125th president of uh, Meharry Medical School. And uh, it was a treat that we got a, a primer, is it word primer or primer on everything that you need to know about COVID. And despite the fact that we've been talking about COVID for the past two years, uh, I still got refreshed on a lot of information. And uh, even more, I'm convinced that even though we are not a political show, but we do want to encourage uh, our attendees that elections have consequences and are very important to the overall and specific health related to communities of color. So uh, we're gonna open our mics and we're gonna have discussion. Uh, our leadership has a copy of some discussion slides and uh, we're gonna start with those and I'm gonna invite uh, uh, them to, uh, to comment as we go. And uh, Dr. Uh, Gibson, I sent you a set as well. Uh, Simon, can you put on the first slide so we can get started? So we know that COVID deaths uh, in the United States are not evenly distributed, that uh, there seem to have been uh, more deaths among Republicans than uh, Democrats. The average excess death rates in Florida and Ohio, and those are both red states, were 76% higher among Republicans uh, between March of 2020 and December of 21, according to a working paper uh, by the National Economic uh, Research. In addition, excess deaths refer to deaths uh, that normally, uh, that's above what we would normally expect. That's called estic, uh, excess deaths. And a study in June that was published in Health Affairs found that counties with a Republican, with Republicans had a greater share of COVID deaths through October of 21 and relating to the majority before. So any thoughts on that, Dr. Walks and Dr. Neighbors Stevens? So uh, Dr. Neighbors Stevens, you can go first or Dr. Hines can go because I have a lot of thoughts about this. Yeah. But... <laughs> These statistics are provocative, but I dare say only scratch the surface of, what's, of what is really happening. The fact that the uh, Republicans had more, the Republican states, let me be more accurate, the Republicans dominated states had higher levels of COVID deaths are a reflection of their uptake of the use of common sense, i.e. masks and disinfectants and, and spacing themselves as well as when they became available, the vaccines. So then that begs the question, well, why were they so reluctant? And the reluctance was part of the dogma that they have embraced um, that was pro promulgated by their titular leader, uh, the then president Trump. 
And they have, as they say, politicized this so that um, they, they seem to not be able to let it go. And they would actually rather die than admit that perhaps there is some truth to science. I'll turn it over to Dr. Walks because I know Dr. Walks is going to give my feelings and his too, and probably several other people's feelings. But he will, he will do it so much more eloquently. I don't know about eloquently. Uh, Dr. Hines, did you want to did you want to weigh in uh, on this? No, I, I thought you did an el el very eloquent job of describing because. To your point, this this particular slide, I think, is uh, uh, partly a reflection of the policies that were in place in those particular states due to, as you said, the uh, alignment of beliefs around politicization of a scientific and health issue, uh, which is rather unfortunate. There are also some demographic things that also align with some of the some of the red states as well that also coincide with you know known risk factors for um, uh, more severe symptoms of COVID. Uh, in addition to just by just from getting COVID, right? So obesity rates and smoking rates and things of that nature that also happen to coincide with some of the red states. Um, so to your point earlier, it, it just scratches the surface and it's not as it's complex underneath there. And you can feel, any of you can feel free to advance the slides as you comment if you want. Well, let me, let me, let me comment on this. Um, I actually, there was an article in the uh, New York Times that I read that dug into this a little bit more. And all I could think of was last week when we had Dr. Hildreth on, there was a comment in the, in the, in the chat that just, just sort of stuck in my spirit and made me sad. And there was someone who wrote in the chat that they don't trust any of the, and there was a list. Don't trust Dr. Fauci. Don't trust the universities. Don't trust the scientists. Don't, and you all may remember that comment. And it made me sad because who are you trusting? If you, if you don't trust the doctors or the scientists or the universities or the researchers or anyone, and then the last part of that had something to do with Dr. Fauci being on the Moderna patent, which was ridiculous. And, and, and so there is this, there's a challenge that not only are these folks listening to the political leadership, whether it be the governor of Florida or the, or the previous president, but they're not listening to anyone who would have some sort of relevant credibility, but anything on the internet is gospel. And that's that's that makes me sad because it it means that we are entering a place where not only will we not be able to give good information to people that they can take in, but that anybody who says, I hate the people in power can then after that write anything and people are going to believe it. And we can remember all the people that believe that the vaccine was going to track them, but they're walking around with a cell phone, which is tracking their every movement. You know, they're, they're all of these things that make no common sense, back to what uh, Dr. Neighbor Stevens said, but somehow make political sense. And once we get to where we are now, where so much is politicized, we're going to see that currently there are about 400 people a day who are dying from COVID. That's just happening. Many of those people are people that are over the age of 50. Maybe I think most of those people are. And then, of course, these are the people who are unvaccinated. And I'm amazed at with that much good information, we are absolutely seeing this kind of a divide um, along political lines when COVID has COVID doesn't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat or independent. If you have some pre-existing conditions, as Dr. Hines just mentioned, and you are over 50 and you are unvaccinated, COVID's coming for you. And, and, and it's, I know we had an announcement that the pandemic was over. Maybe 
that announcement is somehow relevant to the pandemic and people having to line up refrigerated trucks in New York City, but COVID is not over and COVID is still killing people. So, so me, that's 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 my very long-winded way of saying these statistics just make me sad, Dr. Maxey. So let me let me expand on this as we go to the next slide. I believe that even though this slide says that deaths are different between reds and blue states. I think the purposeful part that in the red states, they're willing to lose their red state Caucasian members to get rid of communities of color. And there's still a disproportionate number of communities of color members dying and they're willing to make that sacrifice to see that uh, our voting strength, if you will, or our life strength uh, goes down. And, uh, but uh, I wonder if Dr. Hines might just summarize this slide and tell us what she thinks about that. Sure. So vaccines or masks, right? So this is um, are lower vaccination rates among Republicans possible or did mask use and social distancing guidelines prevent more deaths in count counties run by Democrats? Um, and it speaks to uh, research behind a new working paper that says vaccine hesitancy among Republicans may be the biggest culprit for that distinction that we just referenced in the previous slide. Um, and that there was a much smaller gap between Republicans and Democrats in counties where, in, in the death rates in, in counties where larger portions of the population were uh, vaccinated. And this paper found that the, uh, the partisan group and the deaths widened between April and December of 2021. Um, which was after all adults became eligible for COVID vaccinations. And if you remember around that time, around December, in particular, November, December of 2021, it was like everybody had COVID. Um, ex and excess deaths in Florida and Ohio were 153% higher among Republicans than, than Democrats during that time. And again, that makes sense, right? Co correlating with um, the discrepancy in vaccinations. And it's like, lastly, we don't really see a big divide until after vaccines become widely available in these two states. Um, you might as well look at that next slide too, Dr. Hines. Sure. And while we're transitioning to the next slide, I think this is also, you know, consistent, this difference that's being highlighted is consistent with what we knew all along. Masks were our stopgap until we could get to um, vaccinations. It's not that either thing failed, right? It's in using thing for the purpose, using a thing for the purpose it was intended for. And, and, and masks were, masks and hygiene and social distancing were what we had at the time until, you know, the masks were available. Next, this uh, says that um, COVID vaccination uptake explained just 10% of the partisan gap in the deaths and that research had suggested that compliance with other public health measures such as masks and social distancing were a significant factor. Um, and I think what this is alluding to is some of the same people who were unwilling to be vaccinated were also unwilling to wear masks in public places and um, respect uh, social distancing um, mandates. And to be fair, there, there, there was bipartisan disrespect for, you know, masking and uh, social distancing when, when, when the circumstance suited you, right? Because we certainly saw, if we're, if we're speaking in a political sense, we certainly saw examples of politicians on both sides who, when the, when the circumstances were right, um, let their guard down, we'll say. Um, let's see, vaccination does play a role in the difference that was observed in excess mortality between red and blue, but that's not the whole story. And when you have less transmission, you have fewer cases and less mortality. Um, and the less general transmission that you have by instituting pro protective policies like mass requirements and things like that, um, it's going to be helpful to lowering the overall mortality. And we saw that too. Um, for, when everyone was inside, right? Um, we saw lower incidences of transmission. We saw, you know, lower mortality rates for a period of time, but obviously staying inside is not a long-term plan, 
Again, it was a stopgap. Yeah. Uh, One of the things that impressed me about our talk last week was we've known that this uh, virus can be airborne and aerosolized. But one of the key slides for me that Dr. Hilder showed was you don't have to sing, you don't have to holler, you can just talk in normal conversational tones and that puts virus in the air. So it's really important that just masking, I don't know how much mask costs, but it's a couple of dollars or a couple of pennies, but masking in public place, places seems to be extremely important. That That's the take home for me. Yeah, I, I agree. Because cause the other thing too is, as we've all gone back outside and are trying to find some balance in, in activity, you don't know who you're sitting next to. You don't know who you're talking to. You don't know where they've been. You don't even necessarily know what you may have. So it's it makes sense to um, protect yourself and others. It's funny in the context of the politicization of this issue, when you were so pro-America, right? Like, you know, and the argument was against, against any form of regulation in this space was I'm American, right? And I don't have to, I can, these are my rights. At the same time, being pro-American shouldn't mean that you're willing to sacrifice a million people, a million people. How is that pro-America? Yeah. So, so I saw some of these people who wouldn't wear masks and uh, wanted to come into my office and not be vaccinated. I saw them mentally as being those committing uh, or wanting to commit uh, senior abuse or attempted murder. And so my respect for them decreased. And if you want to kill yourself, that's fine. But don't bring that and threaten my patients and me uh, with those things. Um, so I, I think that we can say as the moderators that even if you don't believe in vaccines, the mask and the social distancing makes sense. Is that correct, Dr. Walks? I think it is correct, Dr. Maxey. And uh, can I just bring in something from, from the chat? Sure. Um, there was a comment in the chat um, that we need to hear more from community people, not just hearing from us. And I think it's a, it's, it's a fair comment. Um, at the same time, I know we have had folks on the Black Health Trust who are not um, physicians and who are in the community. And the other comment is that for, for me, hey, we're in the community. We're, we're doctors, but we see we see patients in the community and from the community. And so we do get input from community folks. So I'm I am happy for that comment because I think it's important for folks to know that not let's everyone have, involved is let's, a let's physician. Let's use that person, Dr. Walks, and let them have a comment. I don't see the the what's in the text is from uh, Tony Wofford, but I don't see uh, um, I don't see a Tony Wofford on the on the chat. Maybe it's one of the folks who has a a, 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 a Samsung showing or something like that. But maybe Dr. Hines, you have better eyes you can see. Or can you find him, Simon? And let him, let's open the mic, let him have a comment. Yeah. Oh, but, awesome. but, go ahead, Dr. Hines, I'm sorry. I was just gonna say that, that um, Tony Wofford also had a comment about grassroots um, uh, movements in this space. Mm -hmm. And again, is a valid com a, a a valid comment. I unfortunately we didn't oh. go into from a public health perspective. I think we didn't utilize the grassroots method and the let's get to your churches and your and and the places where people commune until a little later, right? Um, and some of the things that you saw in some of the other countries where their vaccination drives and things were a little bit more successful, a little bit more quickly, they started at the, they started at the community level. Well, yeah. and uh, I think Dr. Dr. Gibson just put in the chat that uh, uh, Tony Wofford left the meeting and, and which I think is, is sad, but ordinary 
that someone will come in, make a comment that they feel is provocative and then leave. It's really not a provocative comment. That's why I wanted to bring it up because we are interested in Dr. Maxey's uh, comment. Well, go ahead and, and unmute that person. Shows that we want to be inclusive and we want folks who have an interest to, to tell us how we can do better. We, this, is, this is not about Dr. Maxey being famous. That happened a whole lot, that happened a long time ago. This, this is really about us trying to get information that's useful to the, to the community. So I'm really sorry that Tony Wofford left. And if anybody knows Tony Wofford and can reach out to that person, just let them know, hey, hey man, you know, your comment didn't upset anyone. Your comment energized us to try to do more. So, yeah. well, so sad. Let me take a chance. I know we have a, a couple of reverends on the phone. I'm going to ask a couple of them to comment. But first, I'm going to make a comment. We know that a lot of our uh, resistance to wearing masks and vaccination came from certain church organizations, uh, not only the evangelicals uh, that uh, are a lot of them in the South, but also from some of our Black denominations and many of our bishops and pastors were saying, well, God's going to take care of me. He's going to protect me. Or God didn't tell me to take this vaccine or wear a mask. And mm -hmm. so some of this hesitancy came from within communities of color, uh, citing uh, religious reasons uh, not to take that. So I'm going to ask one of our uh, uh, fellow uh, uh, pastors, who's also a physician, uh, just to introduce himself very briefly and have a comment and don't kill me after this, Dr. Tony Brown. Go ahead, sir. And I don't well, know. Well, thank you, Dr. Maxey. So, um, yeah, I, I, I believe that there's always been this, this gap between clergy and clinician. Right. And, and the idea being that, uh, especially in the areas of mental health, but in so-called physical health also, um, many times the civilians, the people like Tony, the other Tony on this call, uh, the non-medical Americans don't really know where they can go to get advice. If it's mental health for, for existence or, for example, um, you might want to go to talk with your pastor. You might want to go to talk with the clergy, but they aren't necessarily trained in things of mental health or immunization, et cetera. Uh, there's a stigma with going to the clinician because nobody wants to talk about mental health. And so you're just kind of stuck in the middle. Uh, that kind of problem with mental health gets exacerbated when we start talking about things like immunization because of course the clergy isn't trained in um, medical topics like that. And so, so what you find is the congregants being pushed towards a profession that does not represent them either in ethnicity, in socioeconomic uh, status. Uh, they just don't see themselves in the clinicians that they have no choice to go to now. And then they get stuck in this politicization of what should just be a medical, a medical matter, not knowing where to go. So Dr. Brown, are you an MD or a reverend? Ah, both, uh, reverend, MD, PhD, a whole lot of stuff. I owe. A lot of other things I, I still owe student loans for, so don't be impressed. <laughs> it just means I'm broke. <laughs> well, well, thank you very much, and I don't believe you're broke. Uh, me and Dr. Walsh are going to come see your 800-acre lake sometime soon. <laughs> <laughs> I would love that. Uh, any if, other comments? Uh, can, if can I, I just comment, on Dr. Max? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Dr. Brown. If I could throw in one other short thing, this, I was thinking this idea of substituting the words Democrat and Republican for American reminds me of you know, the civil rights era when, when they often substituted uh, the words black and white for American, right? And 
I think to do that kind of misses the point. Um, it might be more instructive to talk more about underserved, right? To, to use the word underserved or socioeconomic class. Uh, people that we're talking about who take vaccines but and others who don't take the vaccines. These might be people who are underserved uh, in jobs. They might be underserved in healthcare. They, they're definitely underserved in education about the topic of vaccines. And in this, in this way, it, it's really real how socioeconomic class plays out and how much education about your health you receive that coincidentally plays out in color and political party. So that's it. Thank you. Go ahead, Dr. Walks. You about to say thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much, Reverend Dr. Brown, uh, or as you said, call you Tony. Um, you know, I think it is it is it's very important for us as we as we go through this, in addition to what you talked about, to remember that some of that distrust is well placed in the history and ongoing inequities in medical treatment along the lines of race. We know that black folks historically have gotten treated differently. We know that black folks currently get treated differently. And I think that as long as that science continues to document that, we have work to do. Those of us who are docs and those of us who are docs that are that are doing work in the community, we have to make sure that that stops being true because only when that stops being true can we really get everyone to believe that everything we say is going to impact them the same way it impacts all the other Americans. So I, I'm, I'm hopeful that, that folks like, like like you, Tony, and folks like Randall and Barbara and, and Jocelyn and all the rest of us, that we are continuing to understand our public health obligation to connect with those pastors and connect with those congregants so that we can, what I used to do when I was health officer in DC is I would leverage the credibility of the pastors so that as I went into all of those churches I went into, the pastors would introduce me as someone that they knew so that we could get a public health message to the congregants. And I'll, I'll stop there. So, Dr. Neighbor Stevens, you had some thoughts about some of our past and current statistics. You want to just comment on that before we go to the next slides? Um, sure, but I, I'd I'd like to do well. I'll go ahead and bring up one so people can start thinking about it. But I also would like to bring up something that's in the chat. Um, it caught my eye this week. There's a uh, CDC um, prevalence report that came out, which really caught my eye. As of August of this year, 86% of children in this country between the ages of six months to 17 years have had at least one COVID infection. Let me repeat that. 86% of all American children between the ages of six months to 17 years have had at least one infection with COVID. This is not including the reinfections. Now, why? Th there are a number of reasons why <laughs> it caught my eyes, starting with, of course, because I'm a pediatrician. But besides that, um, those regular viewers will recall over the last two years, we've had several conversations about how to protect the seniors in the home with the children in the home. We've had several conversations regarding what was going to be the impact of children going to school, not wearing masks, which in some of our states, like where I am, were not mandated. Um, and then we've had conversations about long-term effects of COVID. And now to know that 86% of our kids have been infected, have had the opportunity to share the infection, whether they were symptomatic or not, 
in the homes and in the community. And then we don't know. I mean, we're, we're still newbies with COVID and we don't know the long-term effects of COVID. And we got 86% of our children having, under the age of 17 haven't had the infection. This to me was just, it, it just hit me in the gut. I, I was just dumbfounded by this. So I wanted to bring this up. I don't know if anybody wants to make any comments about that. Um, maybe it's not hitting you like it hit me, but I, I just think this is devastating news. I think it's very devastating. And uh, I've got a, a young 10 month old who both of his parents, not my kid, but my grandson, both of his parents uh, got COVID and he was there. So he had no choice but to grin and bear it, I guess. But I was afraid for him, but turned out okay. Well, well, Dr. Dr. Maxey, I think part of, part of the challenge for us is that what Dr. Neighbor Stevens said about we're still newbies with COVID with respect to the long-term effects. Dr. Hildreth had a slide last week that if it didn't if it didn't scare you, it should have that showed all of the different places and parts of the body where we know COVID can take up residence. And so we don't know those kids who were asymptomatic or the adults who were asymptomatic and had COVID in different parts of their body. We don't know what that's going to look like two years, five years, 10 years down the road. We just don't know. And I think that that should hit all of us in the gut that it can go to all different parts of your body and we don't know what the long-term effects are. Yeah, kind of scary. Based on that, I urge everybody to go back to our Black Health Trust on uh, YouTube and look at that lecture again that Dr. Hildreth gave. It was so astute and good that we all ought to look at that again and let it burn in your mind. Um, let's go to the next slide. Dr. Baxi, could we um, talk about something that's in the chat? Sure. Before we go to the next slide. And I, you know, I kind of was a downer with my st statistics. So let me lighten things up just a little bit and say that the reason I am fan is because I have violated a basic Southern principle, which is you don't cook in the oven in the afternoon in the summer when it's hot. <laughs> you cook and with you turn the oven on early in the morning if you're gonna do any baking or whatever. It uh I violated that, and so I'm about to roast. Um, wait, stop! Wait, 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 wait! Stop right there! You violated another southern <laughs> principle, which is you're supposed to invite people over if you're going to be baking. <laughs> so, so uh, Tony Brown and Jocelyn Hines and Ivan Walks and Randall Maxey are kind of put out a little bit right now. But you go ahead. I agree. But like you say, since since I am fanning, um, I want to make a, another health related point. And I received this fan from a senior citizen in a park in China when I was visiting China about five years ago. In the morning, all of the seniors gather in the park for exercise. Mm -hmm. And this particular morning, and, and our tour group joined in with the rest of the nice. people. And uh, this is part of the exercise dance that you use. And it came in real handy today. Um, so the point that I wanted to go back to, because it's kind of related to all of what we're talking about, is are there any thoughts on how testing and screening play a role in what we've been talking about in terms of the impact of the virus? And certainly, uh, we've had these conversations as well uh, about testing and screening. My concern with testing and screening is it and I'm sorry, I'm just there. Uh, it relies on the honesty and integrity of people. And I don't have much faith in that anymore. And so, yeah, I test when I think I have been exposed or, or feeling weird and want to make sure that I'm not infected. But I haven't called the health department and reported anything. And I certainly don't expect uh, people's livelihoods, they're living paycheck to paycheck and can't afford to miss work. They don't have paid time off and can't afford to miss work. So I don't really have much confidence that they're going to be particularly vigilant 
about testing and reporting, uh, which makes me go back to what I keep saying all the time. I rely on my mask. I mean, that's the only thing I personally can control. It would be great if everybody tested every time they thought they had a symptom, but I don't count on it. But that's just my take on the situation. I think you're right on that. And uh, I don't take home tests at my office. You must go to one of the certified testing centers. And I want to hear a neutral third party say that you're negative when you come to the office. And I like that fan, by the way. And I like Tai Chi. And then just to further, because the other comment in the chat in that regard was around the use of stool um, stool samples as a means of surveilling the community. And the benefit of that uh, is that it does it addresses the concern that you just expressed, Dr. Neighbors Stevens, and it takes the human behavior part out of it um, as far as you know who called, who reported. Because in, in, in general, most health departments are no longer set up to take those reports anyway. Um, so even if you wanted to call and uh, report that you tested positive, they're not equipped. To, many of them are not exercising that. Um, uh, contact tracing um, facilitation any any longer. So stool sampling is useful in that. And essentially what it is, is they, they use the wastewater, they, they test the wastewater in an area um, for remnants of COVID virus particles, which are shed, whether or not you have symptoms or don't have symptoms. And you use that as a measure of kind of the disease burden within a community. Um, and that's, and, be, and it acknowledges the fact that you know, testing is no is is no longer mm, really free anymore, and and not nearly as widespread. That uh, doesn't have the widespread availability that it used to. So um, it's another way for the uh, public health officials to kind of have an idea of what's going on, including to know that we are moving in a COVID uptick phase. Um, now, another thing that's also useful in the surveillance space, and, that, and that's been true over these last couple of years, is watching what's happening in Europe, kind of like how we do with flu, right? We watch what's happening, you know, across the ocean, and that kind of gives us a predictor about what's coming our way. Um, and, what, and what's going on in Europe now is that COVID numbers are starting to tick up. So we shouldn't be surprised if in the next, in the coming weeks, as we come across to flu season and holiday season and all of those things, if COVID numbers start to tick up again. All right, uh, let's go to the next slides. So I'm gonna talk just a minute about new treatments. I'm gonna invite Dr. Gibson to comment if he is, feels, uh, feels so moved. Uh, so Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Maxey, I'm sorry, Dr. Jordan had his hand up a little, a little bit ago. Okay, and good. I don't know. If we could unmute Dr. Jordan. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes, yes sir. Hi, Dr. Jordan. I wanted to ask Dr. Neighbor Stevens if she would fax me that article. It's the 86% just seems rather high to me. And I would like to read it just to see if they're talking about subgroups or if that literally means 86% of all kids that age group in this country. But I think you're, you're, someone you're should be assigned to me to read that article in detail and, and to really find out if that's, you know, are they talking about everybody or subgroups or what? That seems like rather high. No, it wasn't subgroups. It was all children. And I will be happy to send it to you. It's on Thank the you. website. OK. okay. Go so, ahead, Dr. Maxson. Uh, Anyway, it's important to remember that while new treatments are effective in reducing severity of symptoms and helping prevent hospitalizations or death in people who become infected, uh, there is no substitute, and these are not substitutes for vaccination, which remains the single most effective strategy to prevent serious disease. And that has been an official position of the uh, Black Health Trust, even though we make sure that we tell people that we are not your doctors, you have to go to your particular uh, physician or health care provider for your individual advice. As an official physician, physician, we recommend that vaccination is still 
the best overall treatment to avoid death and destruction. Go to the next slide. So I've given off a lot of Pax Lovett here and my co-moderators are welcome to comment and especially I wanted Dr. Gibson if he's available uh, to talk about some of these. Pax Lovett is a brand name for an antiviral oral medication and uh, I've given a slew of that and it combines two generic drugs, uh, one of which uh, is the antiviral and one of which allows the antiviral to have a, a longer half-life in the blood so that it can do its job as the viral. So NIH has prioritized its use over other treatments for eligible patients and is meant for people who have current COVID-19. And this goes to the next slide, which is part of this. So who can get it? Are people ages 12 and up who weigh at least 88 pounds and who have positive COVID-19 tests. And you have to take the medication within a five day window of having tested positive. And the usual dose is three tablets uh, three twice a day. And there are a few side effects that are mild and may include altered or impaired uh, sense of taste, diarrhea, increased blood pressure. And I can tell you, I took this myself and it was like day and night because COVID did make me sick despite the fact that I'd been vaccinated and boosted, but I didn't go to the hospital and I didn't die. At least I don't think I'm dead. So we still know <laughs> it's being studied and we don't know all the long-term risks, but right now it's a very important drug. Any comments on this, my panel? If I may. Uh, Dr. Go ahead, Dr. Gibson. Um, you're absolutely right, Dr. Uh, thank you, Dr. Maxi, about uh, Pax a little bit. Um, but there's some caveats that I would love to, to offer with this combination of number 12 here, the <clears throat> antiviral and, and, and the booster uh, that ritonavir that's included in this product. It's in imperative that patients be tested for renal function or kidney health before they are dosed with the medication. So the dose will not necessarily be the same as that that is listed on this slide. I find that a little bit, mm, let me say that, that it, it's a case by case uh, situation. And also in addition to that, it should be duly noted that surveillance, post-administration surveillance has indicated that Paxlovid tends to be more effective for those in their third uh, generation of life. Uh, in other words, over, over the age of, let's say 50, 60, tend to get more uh, positive uh, results from the use of Paxlovid than, than those younger Generations. Are you saying that I'm too young to take it, Doc? Uh, not, not, not yet. <laughs> not yet. Why don't you go to but, the but, next but, slide? You have that deck. The next slide has some of the stuff you're talking about. So, Dr. Gibson is absolutely right. Uh, Dr. Gibson, you want to talk about some of those that. Before you take it, you need to make sure your health care provider knows what else you're taking. Yes, indeed. Uh, unfortunately, we are because we are in the age of complementary approach to health, um, and, and I don't have a problem with that, but it's important to talk that over with your pharmacist, especially because uh, the pharmacists have a pretty good view of what your medications happen to be, uh, but no idea what you might pick up off the shelf. So if you're, you're taking over-the-counter medications such as St. John Watts, as is mentioned here, uh, or other medications that might interact, it's a good idea to have that conversation with your, with your pharmacist to, to uh, possibly mitigate any, any problems that you might otherwise experience. So it's important to have a copy of your medical record or at least your medications and uh, you know, a lot of my patients take all of this stuff from the Joseph's uh, health food store. 
and they have no idea of what that stuff is doing, and you have to know. And in particular, those who have some form of kidney damage, which a lot of people with hypertension and diabetes have, and there's something we look at called the EGFR, which is your kidney function. And if that is higher than it sh should be, meaning you have less kidney function than you would normally, we want to cut that dose of Paxlovid uh, so you don't get toxic. So, Dr. Thank Maxie, you. yes. I think it's worth mentioning that EGFR in Black folks, by the way, has historically been measured. How can I say? differently. What say you? No, you're right. And actually, the guidelines have changed thanks to a, a Black medical student who challenged it that uh, Black folks were being unfairly treated and being guesstimated to have a higher uh, 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 level of kidney function based upon the way the test is. But one of our advisors, Dr. Keith Norris, is one of the leading lights in getting that change. So coming out in the future, the EGFRs will no longer be labeled African-American versus non-African-American. But there is another concern that the Israelis in the past several years identified uh, two genes, APO1 and another one, that appears in the genome of people of West African descent that does show that there may be more of a kidney risk uh, in uh, these populations, but it should not show up in just EGFR. So we'll discuss that in one of our Wednesday night meetings, but that is very true. But what we should know now, based upon whatever your EGFR says, you may want your doctor to give you a lower dose of the Paxlovid. You can take it, but you want a lower dose. So so Dr. Dr. Maxey, you know when you got when you and you and Dr. Gibson and and others start sounding really really smart, you give me a headache, right? So I want I I want I want to go back to the earlier comment about kind of continuing to communicate well with the with the community and um, EGFR. I guess that's the glomerular filtration rate that that all you kidney docs talk about that I heard yes, about sir. last year. I was in medical school. Sure. Yes, sir. All it's right. So estimated glomerular filtration rate. We used right. to use something called glomerular filtration rate, which is woefully inadequate. Uh, so the best way we could get to it mathematically was to create an estimate, which is just a blood test. Okay. And what Dr. Okay. Gibson was referring to is they're no longer going to break it into black versus non-black measurement, which is an insurance issue and a risk factor that shouldn't be taken into account. Okay, so as we, as the, as, as some of the young people say, real talk. Yesterday, I had a friend of mine call me who is over 50, has significant bad asthma, and said, um, I just tested myself and I have COVID. And he was coughing and sounding like a bad combination of Isaac Hayes and Barry White for us old people. And I said, you need to call your doctor. And he said, well, I've paged my doctor. I haven't gotten an answer back. That was several hours ago. I said, well, if you know another doctor, have that doctor call in some Paxlovid for you because I don't want you to wind up in the hospital. The challenge is that when we talk, when we say call your doctor, most doctors are not, they're not available on call whenever you need a doctor. And so I think I think it's important to, to recognize that things like the EGFR and the other things that we doctors know are relevant to what people should do. In the real world, it's hard to factor in all of those things. So I just don't know. I don't know well, what, look at what the last paragraph. Uh, Dr. Walsh, look at the last paragraph in that slide. Pharmacists may also provide Paxlovid. And they know what questions to ask as well or better than most physicians. So if you can't find your physician, go to your pharmacist. If you can find your physician, go to your pharmacist. So uh, Dr. Dr. Gibson, you want yes, people sir. walking into your pharmacy coughing saying, I just tested positive for COVID? Well, you know what? I would much rather they walk in coughing, saying the test tested positive in that 
environment than going into their families and, and, and infecting the whole household. So uh, that's, that's fortunately, uh, that, that's what I've committed all of my life to and, and will continue to do so. Okay, thank you. That's, that's, that, that's very helpful because I think we have to make sure that one of the things we do on, on Black Health Trust is always be as real and transparent as we can, as we do, so that people know that, that what, they, what they're hearing is useful. You can actually use this. So good. Uh, can I also just chime in on that same regard? And, and Dr. Gibson, you can speak on this further, but the, the uh, rules on what pharmacists can do without a doctor's order vary from state to state. Correct. So there, there may be some states where you can walk in, have a conversation with your pharmacist and get the medicine that you need within reason. There, your pharmacist may also be able to administer some, some tests to help clarify what it is that you need or what, the, what your issue is. And, and that might be true in one state, but not true in, in another state. You're absolutely right. And it is a, the responsibility of the practitioner in, on, in each individual case to govern themselves accordingly to the, to the uh, uh, codified measures in their state. And we just had a note in the chat about someone going to the pharmacy and, and not being able to get either information or medication. So, uh, so thank you for that, Dr. Hines and Dr. Gibson, absolutely. Yeah, and I think some of that relates to some of the social issues we were speaking to before. You can go to some physicians and won't get the information. So what everybody's responsibility is is to find somebody who will take the time to give them advice and even in the state where pharmacists cannot prescribe, they still know the information better than the average layperson. So at the least, pharmacists are very knowledgeable. Absolutely. And Dr. May, uh, may, go ahead, Dr. Gibson. No, I was just going to offer that um, many folks have with their insurance uh, uh, programs uh, uh, a system called MyChart. Uh, it's extremely useful for communicating directly with the physician rather than old school calling on the phone. They can send an email directly to their physician. And that's a much more effective way of communicating and getting results. And also, also, also oh, by the way, your prescription information and your lab test information, all of your records and such would be accessible through that MyChart account. And 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 Dr. Dr. Jordan has been on waiting uh, patiently. Dr. Jordan, are you patient? Good morning. Yeah, good morning again. Uh, you know, when we're giving Paxlova, we're only giving it for three days, and so one has to look at the situation. Whereas, if someone thinks they have it, they if they have a primary care physician, that is the safest, easiest way because then that primary care physician will know what your creatinine is, will be able to give you the medicine. But let's just say Dr. Walks has a creatinine of nine, which means he's in moderate renal failure. He hasn't been to a doctor in four years. And, but you know, he's listened to the show. He wants it, he thinks he has uh, COVID, so he wants Paxlovid, and he goes trotting into a pharmacist asking for some Paxlovid. One, will giving him the Paxlovid over three days really affect his kidney? I don't think so. Three days, no. A month, yes. But the real question is, he should have a primary care doctor. And we're still back at that point of what can we do no. Help more people get into a primary care yeah. situation because that's where they are, get the yeah. best information. So, Dr. Jordan, I think your main point is primary care doctors are the backbone of our community. We need to all have one. They should be. But, but uh, the, we have to also say that the recommended treatment course for Paxlovid is five days. And for people- Five days versus three days, I don't care, I'm fine, but I mean, it's not- Okay, hold on. I'm just trying to be clear on what we're saying. 
And we also know that uh, people with severe kidney disease uh, should not be taking the Paxlovid. When they say there's a reduced dose, that's for yeah, you have some degree of renal failure. But there are other things that you might consider taking or let your doctor prescribe for you uh, if you have kidney failure. And just as a, right. a ha-ha with Dr. Walks, if his creatinine clearance is nine, he falls in the thing. He needs to come to my dialysis unit in Puerto Rico. <laughs> can, can, I, can I just say I got I might have 99 problems but kidney failure ain't one uh, go ahead Dr. Hines but what I think what we're talking about here in this discussion as well as what's in the chat is some of the very real barriers that people face even right. when they're trying to follow the recommendations do the right thing move in a timely fashion you know, I, I, I did reach out, but no one called me back. So then I'm, I'm in a position where I'm trying to make the best decision I know how, right? Um, these are all real things that people face when they're trying, even, even when they're trying to comply, you know, with, with the guidance. And I think those are things that we have to remember and hopefully be empathetic towards when we're speaking about, you know, some of the choices that people make, right? oftentimes people make the best choice that they have with the information that they have. One of the things that we might consider talking about on uh, another meeting might be, you know, having someone who can help us understand, you know, credibility and truth in like the, on the internet, right. And identifying credible resources and things like that on the internet, because there's so much information that people are getting that I think they get lost. Yeah, and you're very, yeah. very true. There's a, one of our advisors, Dr. Steiner, who's usually on, says that we should all have a plan and uh, where we pre-think emergencies before they happen. And I think she's striking that exactly that. We need to have a plan for what happens if there's a, a home invasion, what happens if you get COVID, what happens if one of your children gets lost. Is there a communication tree between your family? So those are things that we ought to do as pre-planned. So I think your points are, are well taken. Uh, let's go to the next slide. We got a few more minutes left. Dr. Maxi, while we're changing slides, I need to make a personal message to Dr. Jordan. Dr. Jordan, I was going to send you the article, but I don't have your email. I've sent you a message in the chat. If you could give me your email, I can send you the article. I'll send you email. My email is ttom, T-O-J-O-4-4 at A-O-L. It's, it's no secret, so anybody can have it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to send you some junk email just because you said that. Okay, it's I, got your, I got your email, so I know how to send it I'll back. Send, I'll send it to you, Dr. Nate, but I have it. Okay. Okay, so looking at these next two slides, we're not going to spend any time on that. Just know that there are some other drugs out there. We're not going to exhaust the list. One is called remdesivir. Go to the next slide. And this one called Evoshield. Uh, that is a medication that's given uh, IM. And uh, it's two medications in one. And uh, one is the actual drug that prevents the uh, virus from replicating. The other one is the one that allows it to stay in circulation so it works better. Uh, but it's not as effective at, at some of these new variants that it was originally thought, but it's still something that people can take and you may need it every six Never months. Mind. Next next slide, please. So we want to talk just a bit about breast cancer since this, I think, is this breast cancer month, Dr. Neighbor Stevens? It is. Okay. So... Katie Couric was a well-known uh, news commentator originally on NBC, and I don't know which station she's on now, but her husband died from colon cancer some years ago. But recently she had some problems with her, her own uh, breast cancer. And she also noted that uh, more than 70% of uh, eligible women receive screening for uh, breast cancer. And also that a significant number of women, maybe 45 to 50% have what's known as dense breast, uh, which may be a precursor of breast cancer in some way. 
But a problem is, and you go to the next slide, that only a few states will pay for that under their insurance rules. Let's change that slide. So I wanted to give you a clarifying statement of what you just said. The dense breast issue doesn't isn't necessarily a precursor to cancer. It makes mam using a mammogram as the method of breast cancer screening more difficult. Okay, and what do you do? For the people who have dense breasts? Yes. Uh, MRIs are an option, ultrasounds are an option. Um, mm -hmm. but that that that's the that's the issue with the dense breast that again. Lots of what lots of women have. You need breast cancer screening, but it may a mammogram is not always the best choice for everyone, and it's not even just age based because even some women, you know, over over forty, um, may still have dense breasts. And and essentially the issue is the way a mammogram works, it has to identify. Um, it's almost like a a, a, a super duper X ray. So when you have dense breast tissue. Um, the glands and things that you still have in your breast can obscure the results and make it harder to identify a problematic area from a non-problematic area. So there are other options. And, and I think the, the main point she was saying that a lot of states don't make their insurance companies pay for the uh, exam yep. outside of the regular memory. Yep. Well, did you know all this stuff that Dr. Hines talked about? <laughs> So, 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 Dr. Maxey, in terms of what Dr. Hines just talked about, there was a, a question in the chat. I think you got at it, Dr. Hines, about the difference between a mammogram, a 3D mammogram, and an ultrasound, and which is preferred for dense breasts. It sounds like the ultrasound may be preferred, uh, and and I guess the I guess the question answer is one is an X-ray, one is an ultrasound. Is that essentially yes? Okay. Like so, the 3D 3D mammograms are a a. I don't know how it, the, the, the images are kind of the, the images are the same and this, but they're just not flat. Right. So in, in a way that you could kind of rotate them. Right. But an ultrasound is a wholly different technology um, than a mammogram and an ultra an ultrasound is again, kind of what you use with um, pregnant ladies when you're trying to see the baby and that kind of thing. Um, that's ultrasound technology, mammograms, even 3d mammograms still involve that kind of, upper plate, bottom plate. And then again, like I said, MRIs are also another option for, for dense breasts. Well, and then you. they also have, you can do guided, you could do flora, you could do guided ultrasounds if there's another, if there's a particular problematic area that you're trying to get a sample of that there are, um, there are options. Cause some of these stories that come out about people who were denied mammograms, Sometimes it depends on how you read the article. You got to read the whole story, not just the title. Sometimes you were denied a mammogram because it wasn't the most appropriate test for you. Well, thank and you. May I, may I also add and or ask Dr. Walks, as a former health department leader, uh, to speak to the federally funded breast screening program available to everyone in this country through the health department? I think, Dr. Dr. Neighbor Stevens, as a as a former state health officer, I can say that it is it is absolutely outrageous how many things are available that folks don't know about and don't know to ask about. And I think that it's incumbent upon state departments of health, county and city local departments of health, to make sure that education goes out. And I think I found one of the best ways to do that was to get information out to children who would take it home to parents, um, get information out to churches where it can be disseminated. But I think um, um, EPSDT is my favorite thing that people don't know about. The early periodic screening, uh, EPSDT, early, early period, screening, early screening yes. diagnostic and, and treatment, right? Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's one of my favorite things that people don't know about because it's outrageous that we don't know that all of those services are available to children and Folks just don't go and get it. So no, you're 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 definitely stepping on something that I have tremendous feelings about because it was always I'm sitting in my office wondering why we have all of these things that can help people and people don't know about. And it's not their job to come to us. It's our job as or it was my job as a state health official to get information out to places where people pick up information. Yeah, 
So, you know, that back table, uh, uh, Dr. Reverend Dr. Tony Brown, that back table in all the churches, it's a great place to put information for people to, to, to pick it up. So I just think we have to be a little bit more creative on the on the uh, government side in making sure folks know what we have available. So maybe we ought to pass it out when we pass out communion. Um, Dr. Maxey, that is a whole nother kind of passing out. I, I would like to I would like to think that <laughs> That that the, that the I mean, you got to have some more respect for communion. Get him, get him, get it, get him, Tony. Get him. He, he he's not acting we right. We have to worry. The Lord will get him. Okay. Well, uh, you know, we give so much bad news out to people. I I found a couple of things I thought would add some hope and some good news around the areas of cancer and particularly breast cancer. And it says vaccines are often called the miracle of modern medicine for their ability to target immune systems against disease. And so why not use some of this uh, to treat cancer? Next slide. Well, you know, there is one that people reject every day, which is, I guess, uh, HPV vaccine, which has been out for at least, if not 20 years now, uh, that would prevent um, and it's available for boys and girls given to them at puberty or just at puberty to prevent transmission of the human papillomavirus, which is a major cause of cervical cancer in women and also can cause cancer in men as well as oral cancer. That's great. And the last point on this slide shows that breast cancer accounts for about a third of cancer cases in women and kills over 43,000 people annually. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, Dr. Maxey, every time we talk about breast cancer, I have to just mention, men can also get breast cancer and it's important for men as well as women to be on the lookout for breast cancer. Okay. Especially uh, if you have a strong family history of those, like in, for, for men, especially if you have a strong family history of breast cancer in your family, um, and certainly if you have other another man in your family who has a history of breast cancer. Very good, very true. So on this particular slide, we know that more sophisticated analysis of tumor cells, genetic makeup, is providing the clues about which proteins on the surface of these cells are uniquely cancerous and in which, uh, in which are not. We know that the, armed with this information and this knowledge, scientists have better chance of training people's immune systems. And we talked last week with Dr. Hildreth where a lot of these vaccines are made against the spike, but there's more information in the body uh, of the virus. So we're looking at more parts of this cancer cells. Let's go to the next slide. And, uh, I like this idea of force fields because I like Star Wars. So other recent advances also uh, have nudged researchers closer uh, to try to prevent breast cancer by vaccines. So they've gained more detailed view of how exactly tumors co-opt the immune system. It turns out that these cancer cells, they cloak themselves and they put out a force field so that the immune system cannot recognize them as foreign cells. But now they're able to find a way. Go to the next slide. All you Star Wars fans know about uncloaking. So in 2015, they're able to find this uh, item called an immune checkpoint inhibitor. And this effectively rip off the cloaking of the cancer cell and remove them so that then these supposed uh, vaccines against cancer cells could potentially work. And I thought that was exciting and potentially uh, uh, good news. And let's do one more slide and then we can get off the slides. There's also another thing uh, that these mRNA viruses did and a lot of the technologies going into cancer are the mRNAs, go to the last slide. And one, when these cells of cancer grow fast, one of the things that makes them grow fast is something called telomerase. And that allows these cells to grow fast. So if you can target one of these vaccines to this particular enzyme that stops the cells from going so fast, uh, that would combine with the checkpoint and with the vaccine gives us a good 
factor that we can go after breast cancer and all cancers in a better way than we have in the past. Any discussion on these points, which I think is just a little bit of good news coming down the pike. Dr. Hines? I think it's, it's just an example of the things that we're doing with technology and the way we're thinking in the ways that we are continuing to think outside the box. And I hope one of the takeaways from um, the COVID epidemic will be the benefits that we all see for some of these, you know, diseases that are certainly of wide worldwide impact, the benefit of sharing information, um, the, the channels that they opened up for um, sharing research information and data across ways that that leads to the more, the more rapid development of, you know, drugs and treatments um, in a way that we don't typically go around, you know, drug delivery or drug manufacturing. So I think it's promising. And so, so, so let me let me just say, uh, Dr. Maxey, there was a comment in the chat about whether insurance would would pay for the uh, telomerase. Stalker. I think that what you're talking about, if I if I understand it correctly, is things that are coming down the pike. Some of the uh, it's sort of like those of us who love cars and we're looking at that at that car they're going to produce in two years, not the one they have right now. So this is in that same category of things that are coming. And and again, a reason for us to maybe not go out and, and read all the scientific journals that Dr. Barbara Neighbor Stevens reads, but just be aware of new medical information, new science, and always asking our doctor about what, what potential new things are coming that we can, that we can benefit from. And I'll tell you, everything in the United States is about uh, finance and economics. And uh, if it turns out that they can cut the rate of cancer deaths and cancer hospitalizations, and that's going to save these insurance companies money or the government money. Uh, they'll find a way to make sure more people have it. That's my thought. But who knows? Well, uh, we've done our hour and 15 minutes. And uh, is there any other comments that our moderators would like to make, starting with Dr. Hines and Hines? There is a comment in the chat around the potential for remote breast cancer screening using ex vivo imaging and opening a wide conversation for future healthcare delivery. Um, that must be from Dr. Tony Brown about facial recognition software. That's really interesting. <laughs> no, but I, I do think one of the things as far as remote remote cancer screening is concerned. The, again, one of the potential benefits of COVID is going to be the expansion of remote um, healthcare delivery, right? That, and that's not going to go away. That, that, that is going to expand what people are doing in their homes, how, how people decide whether or not folks need to be hospitalized, um, even, even remote cancer screening. In rural areas, they were already doing, you know, mobile units and things like that to do, to, you know, deliver can breast cancer screenings and breast cancer vans and those kinds of things. So it, it only makes sense that it, the transfer of imaging, right, radiology has been taking place across, you know, where the radiologist is not in the same facility for years, right? So it only makes sense that more types of imaging are going to be available in different formats. Like we see with diabetes and diabetic eye screenings and things like that. Now, now all you gotta do is you, at your regular doctor's office, they can, might have a camera, they take the camera, the images go, you don't even have to go necessarily to the ophthalmologist to get the screenings done. So there's a lot of things that are coming as in the, in the telehealth space and in the remote, remote healthcare space that are, again, are intended to um, expand access. The only other thing that I would just add before we wrap up is we mentioned breast cancer screening and options for, uh, and Dr. Nabert Stevens referenced, you know, talking to your health department about ways to get free breast cancer screening, but there's oftentimes also ways to get cervical cancer screening. Those are your pap smears, right? And colon, colon cancer screenings. And sometimes um, if we're, and sometimes 
on your health department websites, your county or your state health department websites, there's also information about free clinics and things like that if you're not insured um, or, or need medication assistance. Your, your, health, your county health departments and state health departments um, have websites and can be a resources for the things that you need that you may not be able to get um, from some of the more traditional methods. Uh, Dr. Walks, I'm gonna send a CIA uh, kidnap team to bring Dr. Hines out here to work with me. Is that okay? <laughs> let, can, can, let, let me just say this before I make my comments. Uh, Dr. Hines is, uh, is, is a real blessing for us on the Black Health Trust. She has been uh, uh, snatched up more than once to give um, very large presentations that are very well received. She's just, look, people say that, you know, some Black folks are kind of smart. She's on that list. So we, just, we, just, we love when Dr. Hines is able to be, to be with us. Um, there, Dr. Maxey, there are a couple of comments um, in the chat um, that I think if, if I, I struggle sometimes with paying attention and reading the chat. I just want uh, to, to make a case for folks who are able to read the chat. We have a lot of people that give very useful comments in the chat. And so if you can get to it, and read through it as we're as we're doing the meeting. That's wonderful. The the one comment I wanted to make. There was something in the chat earlier about uh, um, uh, what what the Black Health Trust does with guests and how we've had some musical guests on who have have tied what they do to health. I remember I I, I have loved Patrice Russian for decades, and when she was on and talking about the use of uh, music in 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 therapy was just wonderful the comment is maybe if we had some some younger guests on some athletes on that would be that would be great i would be happy if anybody knows some some uh some athletes and want to send their information in to the black health trust folks that would be willing to come on and talk about uh about how they manage their health and maintain their health i would love to hear from someone like uh lebron james who whose health is of paramount importance to him and who spends so much time on healthy diet and healthy activities and things like that. And we've had folks on who have talked about healthy diet and healthy activity and being able to do a lot of the health maintenance that we can do as individuals. So I think all of those are great suggestions. Please feel free to send in guest recommendations for us of people who can do that real talk about what folks can do at home and folks can do at work and those kinds of things. And please don't, my last comment is this, don't let people off the hook to whom you have access. Don't let your pastors off the hook if you know that there's no health information in your church. There's, there's nothing in the Bible that says that church should not help people stay healthy. In fact, there's some stuff saying it should be related, right? So I think it would be it would be helpful to not also let your school principals off the hook. Is there any good health information that is available for the kids to take home as they walk through? When I was a kid, Dr. Maxey, everybody smoked and recycling wasn't even a word. And we were able to get people to stop smoking in many cases and to begin recycling because kids got those messages and took those messages home. So everybody pastor's not belt. off the hook, teacher's not off the hook. And people wear seatbelts now. There and also another statement is faith without works is dead. So this so Dr. David Stevens. Is she still on with us? She's she she's on mute though. There we go. Uh, uh, Barbara cannot get off. There we go. Yeah, I'm off. Yeah, thank you. My uh, my closing thoughts on a number of things that we have talked about is that we have an unbelievable opportunity in this country to access a lot of cutting edge technology, talking about medicine, telehealth, or whatever. What we don't have, or we are struggling with in this country, is a healthcare system mm. fragmented, and that is basically not a two-tier system, where you get access to stuff if you got money, and you don't have access to stuff if you don't have a lot of money. And it's getting worse every single day. There was a comment in the chat about telehealth and 
Some doctors do it and some doctors don't. Well, first of all, doctors who are in practice, whether they are in an independent practice or in an owned practice, are only going to provide those services that they get reimbursed for. Mm -hmm. Very few, except the concierge practices, where they are independent of any insurance payment system. And it is a transactional, transactional relationship between you and that concierge physician. Um, can you get around that, that barrier? But I just, again, this week saw an article that was talking about, even though earlier in the year, there had been conversations around the decline in the use of telehealth. This article is actually saying, oh no, it's 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 picking up now, not across the board and, and not evenly. Uh, there are some areas of specialty where it's being utilized more than in others, but it's come, I mean, it's the use of telehealth is only going to increase and it will be more widely available as time goes on for a lot of reasons, not the least of which. And I keep coming back to this because I think this is another fundamental weakness in our healthcare system. We don't have enough providers. If everybody picked up the telephone and tried to make an appointment with a primary care doctor in this country, the wait list, the wait time would probably be six months or more. We don't have enough providers. And heaven help you if you have a mental health issue. The availability of behavioral health individual uh, is just so maybe on another at another Sunday, we can talk about navigating the healthcare system and some of the efforts that um, I and others on the call and in the certainly in this country are working very hard on, which is pipeline programs trying to increase the number of healthcare physicians and providers, especially people of color, in those areas so that we can begin to increase the numbers that are so woefully inadequate. Thank you very much, Dr. Neighbor Stevens. Uh, Dr. Walk, you don't see anybody waving their hand? I don't see anybody waving their hands and it is 428, Dr. Maxey. Okay, well, my comment is thank you everybody for joining our program today. Uh, we'll be back next Sunday and thank our moderators and others who have commented. Have a great Sunday. Have a good day. Good day, Thanks, everyone. Simon. Thank you, Simon. Bye.